So hello, uh, welcome ev everyone to a new session of the uh, Leuven seminar. And uh, so before we start, uh, I would like to kindly ask you if you could turn on your cameras so that we can see each other, if, if at all possible. Uh, if not, it's also okay. Um, and yes, so uh, today it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, our speaker, uh, Professor uh, Matteo Favarecci uh, Campo Zampiero. He's uh, associate professor at the University of uh, Venice, and uh, he works on uh, early modern philosophy. He has published uh, several papers on uh, Leibniz, uh, Wolf, uh, and uh, Spinoza. And uh, among, these, uh, among these many papers, I would like to mention some of them. So he published a paper called uh, Leibniz Appropriation of Spinoza's Argument Against Mind-Body Causation in the Leibniz Review, uh, published in 2021. Uh, he also published a paper on uh, occasionalism at a crossroads, Leibniz stepped to Malebranche in Studi Lociani, and uh, in another paper, uh, Machines of Nature and Machines of Art, Christian Wolf, Christian Wolf's reception of Leibniz in Rivista di Storia della Filosofia. So uh, we're really looking forward to, uh, to, professors, uh, to Professor Favaretti's presentation, and uh, he will give a talk of uh, about 40 minutes. And after his talk, uh, it's also my pleasure to introduce you to the respondent, Professor Corey Jake. Uh, he's professor at the University of uh, Western Ontario, and uh, he was also a, a Humboldt scholar at the Martin Luther University, Universität in Halle, Wittenberg. And uh, as most of you probably know, he works on Kant and the history of German philosophy. And he has also several publications on the topic, such as the monograph uh, Kant and Rational Psychology, uh, published by Oxford University Press in uh, 2014. Uh, he, he also edited many volumes uh, on, uh, on, on, on similar topics. One of them was also the, uh, was also the, the topic of one of our sessions in the Leuven Seminar, uh, a book on women and philosophy in the 18th century Germany. Um, and, and he has also several uh, papers on, uh, on Kant, Leibniz, and, uh, and early modern philosophy. So uh, Corey Dyke will give then, will respond then to, to Professor Favaretti uh, in about eight to 10 minutes. And then uh, Matteo Favaretti will have uh, five minutes to respond to the response. And uh, after that, we will open the floor and we'll have uh, a general discussion. So uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to receive both of you uh, today. And I'm really looking forward to, uh, to the talk and to the discussion afterwards. So Professor Favaretti, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for this uh, introduction. And thank you, Karen, for inviting me. And thank you, Corey, for being here to discuss my talk. Well, in the, in the last few years, I devoted some, uh, some attention to the German debates on immortality and related topics. So what I present this evening is uh, the last part so far of this uh, investigation on post Leibnizian theories of immortality. So after Leibniz's treatment of immortality, most German philosophers accepted his distinction between indestructibility on the one hand, which is a property of all simple substances, and immortality in the strict sense, which is a property of rational souls or spirit alone, which also entails a preservation of personal identity in the afterlife. 
And my focus today is not on mortality proper, but on this kind of survival, which is mere indestructibility. And in particular, I focus on Moses Mendelssohn's attempt to prove the indestructibility of the human soul as a precondition for immortality. So in the first dialogue of the freedom, which includes three dialogues, as you know, we find a complex argument to the effect that the soul cannot naturally cease to exist because simple beings can perish only by sudden annihilation or by gradual extinction, both of which involve a leap, a leap from being to nothingness, which would be impossible. In the second edition of the Critical Pure Reason, we find a well-known recitation of Mendelssohn's proof of the persi persistence of the soul, in which Kant argues that the soul might disappear by, quote, gradual remission of all its powers, or what Kant calls a languescence. And the interpretation of both Mendelssohn's proof and Kant's refutation is highly controversial, as you know. But in this talk, I will not discuss Kant's refutation. Rather, I will approach Mendelssohn's argument by trying to cast light on the sources of this argument. According to my reconstruction, the main idea is that Mendelssohn drew inspiration from Boscovich, from Roger Boscovich's doctrine of continuity to build an argument which had Boscovician, Boscovician premises, but built into a Wolfian frame. So this will be the main idea that I will try to convey to my audience. I would like to say that whereas knowledge of Wolf's legacy in the German Enlightenment has improved in the last few decades, Boscovich's influence is still largely underrated, and in particular, the reception of his doctrine of continuity outside mathematics and physics is almost unexplored. Mendelssohn's interest in Boscovich's doctrine shows how relevant the problem of continuity was to metaphysics as well. More generally, I think that the, this episode is emblematic of the links between mathematics, physics, and metaphysics in the pre-Kantian age. So let's begin with Wolf. And I share my screen so you can have the, the passages I quote before your eyes. Well, in the... Um, in the rational psychology, both justify the distinction between immortality and indestructibility by pointing out that the concepts of death and destruction be not two different events. If we are talking of the living body, death is the moment in which all the organs cease to perform all their functions. After death, the body undergoes processes of corruption or putrefaction that eventually lead to the complete dissolution of the structure of the body. And this final outcome is what Wolf calls interitus destruction. However, destruction doesn't entail annihilation because the matter of the body is not annihilated. It is simply disintegrated into particles. The case of the soul, however, is different. The soul is a simple substance, the void of parts, parts void. Hence, it is impossible for it to dissolve into parts, and when this dissolution is completed, to cease to exist. So the process of corruption cannot affect the soul, as the picture changes in this way. However, incorruptibility is not sufficient to rule out that the soul is exposed to death and destruction. It only makes the transition from death to destruction necessarily different from what happens to the body. In the case of bodies, this transition is gradual. There is a shorter or longer interval between physical death and destruction. By contrast, for incorruptible entities like souls or spirits, the transition must be immediate. 
if a spirit is destroyed, it is destroyed in an instant because its destruction cannot be a consequence of gradual decomposition. In the case of simple substances, destruction can only consist in annihilation. The soul can perish only by annihilation. And since destruction is an inevitable consequence of death, the, the death of the soul must result in its immediate annihilation. The death of the soul, unlike that of the body, leaves no cadaver behind. The soul must either leave or cease to exist at all. If it dies, it must immediately vanish. Now, both Leibniz and Wolf recognize that our soul, by simple and indestructible, can nevertheless be annihilated. Annihilation is metaphysically possible because God has the power to annihilate. But it is physically impossible because natural causes don't have such power. In the German metaphysics, Wolf uses first the traditional simplicity argument to conclude that simple beings can only cease to exist by annihilation. Second, he applies to annihilation what he has established about creation, namely that simple beings cannot be formed little by little since they contain a plurality of parts that may follow on one another. So just like creation, annihilation cannot be a gradual temporal process. If a simple being is to cease to exist, it must be annihilated at single blow, so to speak. This leads Wolf to assume that creation and annihilation must be supernatural events. For unlike natural events, miracles are not gradual. They don't happen little by little over time, but all at once in single instance of time. Thus, Wolf concludes that simple beings cannot begin or cease otherwise than by miracle, insofar as they must begin and cease at once and in an instant, if they are to begin and cease at all. The key premise in this argument is that events are natural if and only if they happen gradually. Since all changes in the physical world are brought about by motion, and since the division of matter makes the communication of motion happen little by little, all changes in bodies must happen little by little as well. Thus, all events must arise little by little, by degrees. In other words, nature makes no leap. Wolf understands the absence of leaps as a manifestation of the rational connection of things in the world. So to happen by leaps not, is not simply to take place suddenly in the, in the sense of very quickly. Actually, writes Wolf, the leap doesn't refer to time, but to the connection of things to how they come from one another. And this happens by degrees, if in the preceding being, we always find a sufficient reason why the other comes from it. So there is a leap in a series of states, if and only if some previous state contains no sufficient reason for the following states. The gradual character of natural processes is simply a consequence of the principle of sufficient reason. Leads cannot take place in nature because they are unintelligible and would make events impossible to explain from their causes. Now, let's turn to Mendelssohn. In the Phaedon, Mendelssohn invokes the principle that nature makes no need to establish the impossibility of annihilation or transition from existence to non-existence. In the first dialogue, Socrates asks what happens when the structure of the body is entirely decomposed into its smallest parts. Do these parts cease to undergo changes? Are they entirely lost? Impossible. For is there a mean between being and non-being? 
nature can produce no such changes which happen suddenly and without transition. Thus, not even the soul can undergo sudden mutilation. Mendelssohn considers the alternative hypothesis that the soul disappears by the gradual extinction of its powers, but rejects it for the same reason he, reje he rejects sudden annihilation. Because however gradual, the loss of powers by the soul cannot result in complete extinction otherwise than by a leap, a leap from existence to non-existence. The soul cannot perish in eternity, for the final step, one may postpone it as long as possible, would still always be a leap from being to nothingness, which can be grounded, which it can have a sufficient reason, neither in the essence of an individual thing, nor in the entire connection of things. Therefore, the soul will continue and be eternally existing. To deny that there can be sufficient reason for the leap from being to nothingness, either in the essence of the thing that is, that, is appear, that is appears, or in the universal connection of things, is to deny that nature can make such a leap. Of course, Mendelssohn's recourse to both the law of continuity and the principle of sufficient reason to rule out natural annihilation has a Wolfian flavor. However, I think that Wolf's influence alone is not sufficient to account for Mendelssohn's use of the law of continuity. Wolf conceived of continuity in terms of order, not in terms of infinite divisibility. Thus, his doctrine offered little defense against Maupertuis, who attacked the law of continuity by claiming that every change, however small and however great, is as discontinuous as a sudden destruction of the universe, insofar as it involves transition from one degree to another. Thus, what Mendelssohn needed in order to make his argument work was a doctrine of continuity that was immune to, to this objection by Maupertuis. And he found this doctrine in Boscovich. In the Phaedon second edition, Mendelssohn reveals the source of his doctrine of continuity. Father Boscovich, he writes, who has put the law of continuity in an excellent way, deserves to be read again on this subject. And Mendelssohn refers to two works by Roger Boscovich, the dissertation De Continuitatis Lege on the Law of Continuity of 1754, and the treatise Philosophia Naturalis Theoria, Theory of Natural Philosophy of 1758. What does Boscovich's idea of continuity contribute to the Fedor Sarkin? Boscovich's law of continuity states that any quantity in passing from one magnitude to another must pass through all intermediate magnitudes of the same class, which entails that no increase or decrease in a quantity can happen in an instant, but only in the interval of time between two instants. Like Aristotle, Boscovich maintains that the very nature of the continuum entails that any two consecutive parts of the continuum must have a common boundary. Two parts of a line are delimited by a point, two parts of a surface are delimited by a line, and two parts of time are delimited by an instant of time. In the same way, two consecutive variations of a quantity are delimited by a determinate state or magnitude of that quantity. So instants of time and states of quantities can be represented by geometric points because just like points, they are only boundaries between consecutive parts in continuum. In a somewhat Newtonian fiction, 
the continuous variation of a quantity is geometrically represented by the flux of an ordinate that shifts along the axis that represents the continuous succession of time and acquires a specific magnitude at each single point or instant. So that there is no point in the axis or instant in time that lacks a corresponding magnitude of the ordinate and vice versa, of course. Boscovich relies on such geometric representations of variation over time to argue that variation can only take place in continuous intervals, what Boscovich calls tempuscular, no matter how small, but not in instants. So his argument pivots on the impossibility of contiguity between indivisible and no two points can be perfectly contiguous to one another, that is so close that no intermediate point can be found in between. On the contrary, there must always be a line that stretches from the one to the other. For if their distance were reduced to zero, they would necessarily coincide with one another and thus merge into one single point. Nor are there two contiguous points, one of which is the end of the first segment and the other the beginning of the next. For two indivisible and unextended things cannot be contiguous without their compenetration and coalescence into one. The same principle also holds for both instants of time and states of quantity. In the same way, there is no instant of time that is so near to another instant that has come before it, that it is the next after it. But either they are the same instant or the lies between them a continuous interval that can be infinitely divided by, an, by other intermediate instants. Likewise, there is no state of a continuously varying quantity so near to the preceding state that it is the first state after it. From this impossibility of contiguity, Boscovich derived the impossibility of leaps in continuous changes. In nature, if a quantity were to leap instantaneously from one magnitude to another without passing through all its intermediate states, it would have to acquire two magnitudes at the same instant namely the last magnitude of the preceding series and the first of the subsequent series, as you can see in this figure. TD and DF share one boundary point in time at which there should be two different states, but these two different states cannot be contiguous in time because continuity is impossible. Therefore, they must either separated by an interval or be coincident in a single instant. But the latter is impossible because in this case, a quantity would have two different values at the same instant. So Boscovich concludes that leaps are impossible. Thus, in any finite real series of states, there must of necessity be a first term and a last. And so if a leap is made, there must be, at the instant at which the leap is said to be accomplished, a twofold state at one and the same time. Now, since this cannot obtain, that leap absolutely cannot obtain either. Boscovich's doctrine provides the premises of Mendelssohn's argument, the premises concerning the continuity of natural changes, the continuity of time, and the correspondence between the series of changes and the series of times. Concerning natural changes, Mendelssohn claims that change doesn't happen suddenly, but gradually. Insofar as the transition from one state to the opposite one, the transition from like to that, for instance, cannot be immediate, but always requires a transition through intermediate states. 
nature, in all its changes, knows to find an intermediate state, which serves as a transition. Likewise, to go from one state to the opposite. Nature must take all, all intermediate states with it when it wants to alternate the state with its country. However, we should bear in mind that Mendelssohn, like Voskovich, consider states to be boundaries. For instance, Mendelssohn describes the dissolution of the body as a process that happens so gradually in such a continuous order that every state can be called a common boundary of the previous and the following states. Concerning time, Mendelssohn claims that time is continuous in the sense that it is impossible to find two instants which are the closest to each other, that is so close together that there is nothing between them. Time is not made up of continuous instants. Like Boscovich, Mendelssohn infers continuity from the impossibility of continuity. For instance, here is a passage from the second edition of the table. The parts of time have common boundaries. The smallest portion of time is such a series of moments and may be subdivided into even smaller parts, which still always preserve all the properties of time. There are, therefore, no two moments that are the closest to each other. and between which it is impossible to conceive of a third. Finally, from this premises concerning change and time, along with the assumption that changes progress at the same pace as time, Mendelssohn derives the proposition that change is continuous on a par with time for there are no two states which are the closest to one another. Like Boscovich, Mendelssohn models the structure of change on the structure of time. The succession of the changes coheres with the succession of time and is therefore so constant, so interdependent, that one can specify no states which are closest to one another or between which no transition should take place. Let's now turn to Mendelssohn's argument against annihilation. The crucial step of this argument concerns the impossibility of contiguity. In case of annihilation, being and non-being would be two states which immediately follow on one another, which must be the closest to each other. However, we have seen that nature can produce no such changes, which happen suddenly and without transition. States are like points in a continuum. States, point, and instance are not parts of the continuum, they are bundles. Two different states cannot be continuous in time, because if there were no distance or no interval at all between them, they would simply collapse into one. Two boundaries that immediately follow upon one another are one and the same boundary. This is precisely what happens to states of being and non-being if they are assumed to immediately follow upon one another. As there can be no intermediate state between being and non-being, the last instant of existence and the first instant of non-existence should be contiguous but since two instant in continuous time cannot be continuous without coinciding altogether, the last instant of existence would be the first instant of non-existence. The transition of an entity from the state of being to the state of non-being should be instantaneous in the sense that there would be an instant at which that entity would both be and not be which is a contradiction. As with Boscovich, Mendelssohn's point is that contiguity is ruled out by the continuity of time, whereby two points in time that lack intermediate points cannot but be one and the same point. 
Now, how did Mendelssohn get the idea of applying Boscovich's doctrine of continuity to the issue of annihilation? This idea actually came from Boscovich himself. After developing his argument against the leaps in natural changes, Boscovich observes that his argument seems to entail the impossibility of both creation and manipulation. He introduces the issue as an objection against the argument itself. It seems that from this argument, it follows that both the creation of any things and its destruction are impossible. For if the last term of a series that precedes is to be connected with the first term of a series that follows, then in the very transition from existence to existence or vice versa, it will be necessary that the two are connected together. And then at one and the same time, the same thing will both exist and non exist, which is absurd. I think this passage is a direct antecedent of Mendelssohn's argument against annihilation. Even when Mendelssohn addresses the hypothesis of the gradual extinction of the soul's powers, the process that Kant, that Kant called languescence, he reasons along the same lines. However gradual, this process must have a final step, a leap from being to nothingness which would make these two states impossibly contiguous. If the soul were to eventually cease to exist, the previous interval of its existence and the subsequent interval of its non-existence would have to share one single boundary point in time, for there can be no intermediate state between them. Hence, the state of the soul at the boundary point would have to be both a state of existence and a state of non-existence. However, there is a difference between Mendelssohn and Boscovich. Boscovich presents his argument against creation and annihilation as an alleged consequence of his argument against lives in nature, and therefore as an objection to the talking. If the doctrine of continuity entails the impossibility of creation and annihilation, this is for Boscovich a good reason for questioning the doctrine of, of continuity. Boscovich fears that his argument might be used to challenge the creationist dogma. He doesn't even consider its usefulness for defending the indestructibility of the soul. The argument runs as follows. In the case of transition from non-being to being or vice versa, there would be a conjunction of two states, the series of the thing state of being and the series of its states of non-being. At that boundary point shared by both spheres, the thing would both be and not be, which is impossible. To defeat this argument, Boscovich highlights its implicit precondition the precondition that both series be series of real states. If they are, the argument works. Hence, if to one series of real states there succeed another series of real states also, which is not connected with it by a common term, then indeed there must be two states at the same instant namely those which are their own, their two units. But if the states of either series are not real, the conclusion doesn't follow. This makes it possible to resist the anti-creationist dogma by rejecting its presupposition that states of non-existence are real. And there are no real states before creation and after annihilation, such events entail no impossibility. Since non-existence is mere nothingness, a series of this kind requires no extreme limit, but is immediately and directly cut off by existence itself. Wherefore, at the first and the last distance of that continuous time during which the thing exists, it will, it will certainly exist, 
without the deep existence being simultaneously connected with non-existence. So non-existence has no real boundaries. There is neither a first nor a last instant of non-existence. Any contradiction that would arise at the boundaries is prevented simply by expelling non-being from the boundary parts themselves. So that there is no contact between the series of states of existence and the series of states of non-existence. Thus, Boscovich defends the possibility of annihilation, which Mendelssohn denies. However, the annihilation that Boscovich admits as possible is not continuous, like natural changes, for nothingness cannot be the final term of, na of a natural process. If so, ilanguescence is impossible for, for Moscovich too, for the final point of a real series cannot be nothingness. Nevertheless, for reasons that I cannot fully develop here, for reasons of time, I don't think that the reference to Boscovich is sufficient to explain why Mendelssohn assumes that even the gradual extinction of the soul's power would have to involve a final leap from being to nothingness, or why he assumed that Boscovich's argument against leaps in nature applies to the case of the illanguescence as well. My suggestion is that Mendelssohn approaches the hypothesis of gradual extinction from a Wolfian point of view. So we need to go back to Wolf once again. At first sight, Wolf seems to consider only the hypothesis of sudden annihilation, without mentioning anything like disappearance by illanguescence. However, a closer scrutiny of both the Phaedon and the German metaphysics reveals a further borrowing by Mendelssohn from Wolf. In the Phaedon, the first occurrence of the hypothesis of gradual extinction is strikingly different from the subsequent formulation that we find in the Phaedon. Mendelssohn introduces this alternative as one of the two possible ways in which we might conceive that the soul dies. Either all its powers and faculties, its actions and passions suddenly cease, and the soul disappears, as it were, in an instant, or like the body, it undergoes gradual transformations, innumerable changes of appearance, which proceed in a continuous series. And in this series, there is an epoch where it has ceased to be a human soul, but has become something else just as the body, after countless transformations, ceases to be a human body and becomes dust, air, plant, or part of another animal. Is there a third case in which the soul can die other than, by, than suddenly or gradually? After a few lines, Socrates reformulates the same alternatives by saying that the soul may either Appear suddenly or gradually cease to be what it was. Thus, the alternative that is subsequently described as a gradual loss or vanishing of the soul's inner power is initially presented as a gradual transformation. In this first presentation, to gradually die means to become something else whereas in the subsequent discussion, it means to turn into nothing. Why does Mendelssohn shift from gradual transformation to gradual annihilation? Is it a real change of subject or is transformation meant to be somehow equivalent to annihilation? This is why we have to take a glass at both. Because after establishing that simple beings can cease to exist only by annihilation, the German metaphysics addresses the objection that a simple being could cease by transformation, insofar as a being having a different essence would result from it. 
This hypothesis is similar to Mendelssohn's first formulation. Although Volk doesn't expressly characterize transformation as gradual, his example, taken from the natural world, shows that he has a gradual process in mind. Both explains that people find the transformational hypothesis convincing because such transformations are supposed to actually take place in composite beings. And he writes, as when a tree develops from a leaf. So if composite beings, like material bodies, cease to be what they are by evolving into something different, why cannot simple beings undergo something similar? It is the same soul-body analogy that we have just found in Mendelssohn. The soul might cease to be a human soul and become something else, just as the body after countless transformation ceases to be a human body and becomes dust to your plant, and so on. Wolf's reply to this objection is based on, on, is based on his doctrine of essences and the principle of sufficient reason. If the transformation has its reason in the thing's essence, then it is a mere change of state of a thing that remains essentially the same, it doesn't cease to exist. If it has no reason in the thing's essence, then this essence would have to change in order for the thing to undergo such a transformation. But essences for both are immutable. Hence, things cannot be transformed into essentially different things. Both's conclusion is that the, the transformation of a simple being into something else would in fact consist in two distinct unrelated events. First, the sudden annihilation of the former being, and second, the sudden creation of a new being from nothing, which confirms that a simple being cannot cease otherwise than by being annihilated. Sketching the alternative of sudden or gradual disappearance, the German metaphysics is likely to have inspired Mendelssohn's similar distinction. And in, in this perspective, Mendelssohn's shift from gradual transformation to gradual annihilation is not a complete change of subject. For annihilation is simply one half of the process of transformation, the other half being the creation of another entity. If so, Mendelssohn's refutation of gradual extinction appears reminiscent of Wolf's refutation of the transformational hypothesis. Wolf's point is that radical transformation, unlike mere alteration, mere change, requires annihilation, so that ceasing to be by transformation is no real alternative to annihilation. But since annihilation necessarily happens in an instant, even disappearance by transformation cannot avoid the leap from being to nothingness. So I think that some reasoning along these lines may have persuaded Mendelssohn that even gradual extinction must involve a final non-gradual step of abrupt Initiation. Thus, his Wolfian background prepared and oriented his attempt to use Boscovich's argument against this continuous change to rule out not only sudden annihilation, but also gradual extinction. I come to my conclusion. The intricacy of the Phaedon's argument for the indestructibility of the soul reflects Mendelssohn's effort to intertwine multiple lines of reasoning stemming from different sources. Drawing both Leibniz's view that death is not the real termination of life, that no, no entity ever really dies, and Wolf's argument against the possibility of natural annihilation, 
Mendelssohn transferred Boscovich's doctrine of continuity from mathematics to physics, from mathematics and physics to rational psychology. However, in spite of the Leibnizian emphasis on the continuity between life and the afterlife, the Phaedon tended to depict the immortal soul as a pure spirit entirely separated from the body, in keeping with the platonic inspiration of the dialogue. That is why it was so important for Mendelssohn to specify what happens to the soul at the moment of the body's complete destruction, and not only at the moment of death. Although, although his deepest belief appears to have been that, quote, no limited spirit can be entirely without the body, end of quote. In the Phaedon, he wittingly omitted this esoteric Leibnizian doctrine and favored instead the more familiar view that the human soul is not forever united to an organic body. So in this way, Mendelssohn committed himself to the spiritualistic tenets of Boykin rational psychology, which were to become one of Kant's main targets in the first critique. So, thank you for your attention, and if you have questions, I will be delighted to try to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very rich and stimulating talk. And, uh, and now we'll listen to our respondent, uh, Kari Dyke. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to hide myself so I'm not staring at myself while I'm talking. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for this presentation. Everybody can hear me okay? Yeah, there we go. Yes, uh, yes. Matteo, um, I, uh, uh, I thought it uh, uh, nicely exhibited your uh, characteristic blend of rich historical detail uh, and deep philosophical rigor. I learned a lot from it. Uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the valence of my comments are not going to be critical because I think uh, I, I accept your, your account uh, more or less wholly. Um, but I, I want to offer just kind of two invitations to speculate a bit uh, and then offer a piece of historical context that didn't come up in your in your presentation. Um, but I'm curious to know whether you, you think it might be relevant. Um, but just to kind of maybe a, a first preliminary point um, is uh, wh what I thought overall um, was uh, shown by the paper is uh, it, it was it confirms, in fact, Mendelssohn's interest in trying to introduce or draw on mathematics for use in psychology. This is something that he actually expresses elsewhere, which you might be familiar with in the prize essay of 1763 uh, in the discussion. This is on evidence in the metaphysical sciences in the discussion of, of metaphysics. He says, okay, I quote, uh, if we consider mathematics from this side, what an extraordinary light it sheds on psychology, a discipline that appears so, appears so far removed from it. Um, and so in that case, Mendelssohn is talking about uh, the doctrine of intensive magnitudes, which is not unrelated to the general topic you're talking about today. Um, but he thinks that there's real promise for introducing uh, that notion into, into psychology and that it might introduce a kind of mathematical rigor into it as well. Um, the date of the essay is later than Boscovich, so maybe in fact it ends up being Boscovich who, who kind of uh, ignites this, this light in, in Mendelssohn's mind uh, looking for, for mathematical, the, the application of mathematics and psychology. Um, but in any case, to the comments. Um, so the first is, is just a kind of a minor comment. So as you point out, um, in his um, uh, rejection of the possibility of the uh, uh, natural annihilation of the soul, Mendelssohn draws on an argument in Boscovich. However, in, in the end, this is an argument that Boscovich doesn't accept. And so uh, I'm just wondering if, if you have an idea of what, on what grounds Mendelssohn might not be persuaded by Boscovich's rejection of this argument. Is there something, that, why doesn't he find Boscovich's reasons convincing. Um, so I don't, I don't know if you have a sense of that, but uh, I'd be uh, curious to hear your thoughts. Secondly, uh, this is the point of historical context. Um, so in the beginning of, in the setup for your presentation today, you distinguished between two issues, right? So the issue of what amounts to natural immortality or incorruptibility on the one hand, uh, which is an issue concerning the, the, a question about the preservation of substance, 
right? The, whether the substance endures uh, after the death of the body, substance of the soul. And then on the other hand, uh, uh, the issue of personal immortality, which you framed in terms of the, the, the issue of personal identity. Um, and I think that's that's the way, uh, that, that that's the kind of stark way in which Wolf understood the, the, the debate about immortality in the early editions of the German metaphysics, um, more or less in continuity with Leibniz. But in fact, there's a third issue as well, um, which kind of comes in the middle of the two. Um, and it's an issue that was urged on Wolf by one of his students, I think probably his best student, Ludwig Philipp, Philipp Tumig, um, who said that there's also an issue about spirituality, right? So a question about whether the uh, this, the soul will continue to preserve its higher uh, capacities that distinguish it as a uh, as a spirit, as a rational being with with a, a kind of a will that's determinable through its through its knowledge, right? So you have the issue of natural incorruptibility, or, I'm sorry, of natural immortality or incorruptibility. Then you have the question of spirituality, and then you have the question of personality as well. So the way in which we can think about these three issues is in terms of the, the philosopher who wants to defend immortality having basically to dismiss three specters, right? So the specter that the soul naturally passes away, that its substance isn't preserved. The specter that the soul uh, survives in terms of its substance, but at the loss of its spiritual capacities, which Baumgarten, for instance, talks about in terms of the sleep of the soul, right? That the soul just falls asleep. It's no longer capable of higher representations. And then the third specter is the specter of, of preserving its higher capacities, but losing its sense of itself. So you might understand that in terms of the preservation of personal identity. Uh, you might understand that in terms of something slightly different, um, uh, uh, you know, because I think personality actually means something different for both. But in any case, there's these three different specters, these three different issues relating to immortality. Um, and it seems to me that the issue of spirituality is actually relevant to the near to the end of your discussion. Because one way in which we can think there being a threat to spirituality is that in, is in a kind of a Leibnizian vein, that what happens after the death of the body is that the clarity and distinctness of our perceptions is dialed down to a degree where we become less like um, uh, rational souls, less like persons, and we become animals, right? Or even worse, we become mere sleeping monads, right? And so there's a sense in which the degree of our of clarity and distinctness can be, can be brought down to a non-zero level, and that can threaten a, a difference in our state in the afterlife. Um, but... And it seems to me that this is what, what might be informing, that this might be informing the discussion in, in the annihilation and transformation bit, is that what hasn't been considered is, is a kind of a complete loss of those capacities, such that it's dialed down to zero, right? So Tumig and Wolf and others in this discussion considered spiritual death to really just be the end of our personhood. But there's another threatening possibility that is that we lose these capacities entirely. And that amounts to a kind of a spiritual annihilation. Um, so I don't know if I'm making sense, but the, the point is that this this might be part of the context for that last discussion in your in your in your presentation, that what Mendelssohn is saying, well, that there's this one possibility that's well understood, but there's this other one where it goes down to zero, and the argument that I've already presented actually provides a, a reason against thinking that that possibility could could transpire, right? And so that still leaves the issue of spirituality on the table, but at least the most nefarious form of that spirituality, when we would experience a spiritual annihilation, uh, is ruled out. Uh, and then the third point, which is, again, another invitation to speculate, and I should say I didn't present any of these comments to Matteo in advance, uh, I, I didn't actually even write them down, um, but uh, because I didn't <laughs> intend these to be critical remarks. Um, but the third invitation to speculate just concerns, right, so so something that's kind of on the fringes of this whole discussion the whole time, right, so we have the, 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 the threat about you know, uh, natural annihilation, in addition to the loss of spirituality and personality, as kind of specters that the rational psychologist has to dispel. But another, another threat that's on the edges here with the discussion of annihilation in particular is, well, that if we assume that annihilation is only supernaturally possible, um, but that should it happen, it would be a really bad thing, uh, and everything else wouldn't matter, uh, shouldn't the rational psychologist assign a priority to addressing that question? So in addition to ruling out the natural annihilation of the soul, doesn't the rational psychologist need to provide an argument against the supernatural annihilation of the soul? Right now, that might seem a lot to ask the rational psychologist to do. And that's exactly what Georg Friedrich Meyer says, is that, well, this is, you know, if you, if you consider the possibility of the soul being annihilated by God, right, well, then it doesn't matter whether you prove the soul is simple. It doesn't matter whether you show that it naturally will preserve its spiritual capacities. All these other things don't matter. And so Meyer basically says that, well, 
because we can't know whether God would decide that the preservation of our, of our you know, the non-annihilation of the soul or our capacities would be part of the best of all possible worlds, there's no point in speculating about it at all. And so for me, this is interesting because uh, it, it just kind of, it, it seems to me just on the fringes of this discussion, but it's, it's Meyer himself is somebody Mendelssohn, as far as I know, never talks about, at least in the context of his the rational psychology. Um, and so I'm just wondering what you might, what you might think about that, either what, what whether Mendelssohn has reasons for not worrying about Meyer, uh, for not taking his concern seriously, or, uh, or what, what, what role the Meyer's kind of greater uh, uh, skeptical challenge might, might pose uh, or might play in Mendelssohn's account. But yeah, again, thank you. I learned a lot from, from the presentation, from the paper, uh, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Corey, for all these questions, which are somehow linked together. There are some, yeah. so I try to, to give an answer that can uh, be, uh, complete but it, it won't be complete but uh, nevertheless i try so i my idea is that um, the post leibnizian debate even within the wolfian school was very uh was not uniform at all so there were different positions and nearly no one really endorsed leibniz's position according to which uh, uh, the soul is forever united to its organic body and death is not real. And uh, I think so. when, when, uh, when Leibniz's doctrine of death became public, uh, there was a strong reaction against this idea, um, which was perceived as some kind of threat to the Christian dogma, because basically, Leibniz is saying that that doesn't exist. So nothing ever really dies, which is, which is unacceptable, I think, for Christian faith, because for Christian faith, death is, is, fun, is a fundamental event. That must be real in order to make sense of the history of salvation. So the reaction against Leibniz was really, uh, how can I say, across the board, so to speak. Even Wolf never mentioned Leibniz's doctrine of immortality as uh, what, what Leibniz called the banishment of death, the exilium mortis. Wolf apparently never, never mentioned the issue. And what he proposed instead was a doctrine of immortality, which uh, uh, was in fact uh, a reformulation of the platonic idea of the, the separated soul that survives without a body and therefore uh, acquires distinct thoughts and so progresses. And so the idea that you have called the spirituality of the soul which is this, uh, 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 which is very different to what from the Leibnizian idea of the afterlife, in which uh, death is uh, represented as a kind of uh, sleep, uh, in which we lose, temp we temporarily lose, of, or only temporarily, of course, but in the in the interval between death and the final resurrection, we sleep. We simply sleep, so our soul loses the uh, cognitive faculties, uh, at least the higher cognitive faculties, and we we are uh, reduced to simple, uh, obscure perceptions. The position of uh, uh, Boscovich, in uh, sorry, of uh, Mendelssohn. Uh, in this debate is ambiguous because in the in the in some private letters and writings he endorses leibniz's idea of immortality the idea that the soul is forever united to a living body which doesn't really die 
at the moment that we call death, but it's not really death. And uh, whereas in, in the Phaedon, apparently, what we find is uh, the, the, the Wolfian idea of uh, a spiritual immortality, whereas the soul uh, simply uh, uh, separates from its organic body and uh, uh, moves to another uh, dimension of existence uh, in which it has uh, more distinct thoughts uh, and so on. So this for, uh, I think that Meyer reaction to come with the, you rightly mentioned Meyer, is another possible reaction to the same uh, uh, debate within uh, the post-Leibnizian philosophers. My reaction is a reaction of people who were, uh, so to speak, panicking about uh, Leibniz's idea of uh, immortality, of natural immortality. And so Meyer's idea is that uh, what, what is natural is death not immortality, the, the, the soul is naturally mortal. And the, so mortalism appears to speak a, a more pious, a more pious uh, position than the, the radical immortalism of Leibniz. So people who were uh, influenced by pietism like Meyer, preferred a mortalist position than Leibniz's radical immortalism, than the idea that the soul is naturally immortal and the body is naturally immortal as well. But the, 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 the problem that, um, uh, to come to another question you rightly posed uh, about Ma Mendelssohn's reception of Boscovich and why he uh, uh, draws an argument, borrows an argument from Boscovich, but he finally disagrees with uh, the way uh, Boscovich responded to this argument, has to do with the problem of this uh, uh, loss of forces that you also have mentioned, this idea that the powers, which is also the center of Kant's refutation, the idea that the soul gradually, the, 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 the power of the soul could gradually diminish without skipping any intermediate value. So in a continuous way, it could diminish to death. So to, 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 to zero and thus uh, then the soul would be annihilated. The point is that Boscovich had the idea that forces can actually diminish to zero without there being an annihilation. So uh, Boscovich admitted, uh, he didn't uh, specify this about the soul, so we don't really know what uh, he thought about the powers of the soul, but concerning natural powers, his idea was that powers can and actually do uh, uh, reduce to zero. Uh, for instance, uh, so a physical force, uh, Boscovich's idea that forces transition from positive to negative values. This is, uh, this is part of his, uh, um, uh, of his uh, theory of, um, uh, of forces, of his dynamics. And his idea is that a force transition from positive to negative values by passing through an intermediate value, which is the zero value. So according to Boscovich, forces can continuously diminish to zero, but this zero is not nothingness, which is simple, it, it, it involves no annihilation because it is not, the, re the reduction to nothing of a substance. It is simply the reduction to zero of a value. So according to Bosco, so we, if we take, if we transfer Boscovich's dynamics to psychology, we should conclude 
that Kant is right. And I think that Kant indeed, uh, Kant had presumably read uh, Mendelssohn's review of, of Boscovich. So he knew something about Boscovich. And I think he could, he could have taken this idea from Boscovich precisely to, uh, to use it against Mendelssohn to say, okay, so you have a, a for the soul has a force and this force can be reduced to nothing, can be reduced to zero without there being something like an uh, impossible annihilation or a leap from being to nothingness or something or anything dramatic. But in, the Vol in a Wolfian framework, which is Mendelssohn's uh, psychological framework, the, the soul can, the fundamental powers of the soul cannot ever be reduced to zero. Of course, my uh, thoughts or my sensations can for a moment uh, disappear. I can be, my, my mind can be for a moment without any clear sensation, without any distinct thought or without any volition and so on. But the fundamental powers, the power of perception or the power of thinking, if we are a rational mind, cannot be entirely suppressed without the soul being annihilated. So according to, to Wolf and according to Mendelssohn, the soul is never, and this is a Leibnizian doctrine, the soul is never entirely without perception at all. So according to the, if we identify the soul with its, with its essential power of perception, then in the case of a complete uh, absence of any perception, so in the complete reduction to zero to, 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 of this uh, uh, essential force of this essential power, then we would have an annihilation of the soul. And I think that, in fact, the, 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 uh, the distance uh, between uh, Mendelssohn and Kant is here, because if you think that the soul has this essential power, which constitutes the very, the very essence of the soul, then the complete annihilation of the, the complete reduction to zero of this power would entail the annihilation of the soul with all these dramatic consequences that you would have a, a leap from being to nothingness. But if you refuse this idea of the substantiality of the soul, then the idea that a force in the world is reduced to zero doesn't entail such dramatic consequences which is Kant's idea that force can be reduced to zero and uh, without uh, there being a leap from being to nothingness. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Matteo. And, and I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, the, the questions were great and, and the discussion is really engaging. And, and thank you. Sorry thank you. for being so, so long in my No, 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 no problem at all. It was, it was very good and, and, and very rich as well. We just wanted to to open the floor for for discussion so that uh, the audience can also ask you some questions and yeah take the opportunity to discuss with you the paper and yeah so thank you thank you thank you both of you it was it was great yeah so if you if you have questions please just uh, use these uh, raise hand uh, function in in zoom and uh, and if it doesn't work just write to me in the chat and i'll give you the word uh Kari. Okay, uh, thanks, Matteo. I, uh, I enjoyed uh, your talk and also appreciate the fact that uh, in your uh, response to Corey, you uh, mentioned Kant, but I think you were referring to the pre-critical Kant. Is that correct? Or... Can you repeat the question, please? Oh, no, well, it was, I was just starting, yes, but uh, I think you were referring to the, to the pre-critical Kant. You were mentioning Kant. 
Yes. So, or, or to which text in particular by Kant? Uh, I was thinking of but the refutation in the first critique is um, preceded by other uh, um, passages, uh, for instance, in the lectures on metaphysics, in which uh, Kant also uh, formulates a similar refutation of Kant's argument. And from these passages, it, they are interesting because they make clear that uh, Kant was well aware that Mendelssohn did in fact uh, consider the hypothesis of gradual, uh, um, of a gradual um, um, reduction of the soul's power, of a gradual loss of the soul's mm -hmm. powers. Mm -hmm. Because the, 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 the usual, uh, the usual problem is uh, why does Kant uh, um, uh, blame Mendelssohn for not considering the possibility of a gradual loss of powers, where when in, in fact uh, Mendelssohn does consider this possibility. But if you take the passages from the lectures on metaphysics, it is clear that Kant knows very well that uh, uh, Mendelssohn does have an answer to this idea and the, 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 to, of the, to this um, does have an answer to this hypothesis and the answer is that there will be a leap even yeah. in the case of a gradual uh, remission of powers yeah okay but uh, but so you know i actually think that um that counts criticism would be more radical and i would even you know want to suggest that um that that Kant must have um abhorred the whole attempt to transfer uh, mathematical principles that that can be applied in physics to uh the domain of rational psychology and that that's that Kant precisely became a critical philosopher um uh, by sharply distinguishing the domain of of mathematics on the one hand and the domain of uh of rational psychology on the other hand or in other terms um the domain of appearances on the one hand and the domain of noumena on the other according to which there is no transition possible and and every attempt to interpret um the soul uh, by relying on mathematical principles would be um, irrelevant and, and uh, unjustified. So for me, it was interesting to see how, how Mendelssohn and, and Boscovitz, how they all try to, um, to solve a problem created by themselves uh, get into a very complicated tangle from which they can very, with very, well, from which they, in fact, cannot really um, um, get away, and you can you can somehow see how Kant realizes that the only possible solution to all the problems that were created by his contemporaries was to introduce this very strict division between um, the realm of appearances on the one hand and and the realm of noumena on the other. Yes, but. Uh, did... In fact, the, the, the refutation that we find in the, in the first critique has puzzled many, many readers because uh, the, the normal reaction is why Kant uses this refutation when he could have uh, easily get rid of, uh, of uh, Mendelssohn's proof. Yeah. Uh, perhaps Kant is trying to do his best to reason uh, within uh, the the Mendelssohnian framework, or uh, I don't know exactly, but uh, uh, it, it is puzzling in some way, and I don't I don't think I have the, the answer to the whole enigma. I think that the reference, the possible uh, presence of Boscovich behind Mendelssohn, that Kant might have suspected, because if he read uh, Mendelssohn's review of Boscovich's book uh, might offer something, not a complete answer, but some elements uh, 
for this. But of course, the the the, the issues that you pose remains. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Rud Schurman. Thank you, Luis. Um, thank you, Matteo. Very interesting talk, and thank you, Corey, for giving some emphasis to the distinction between natural destruction and creation and change and spiritual or supernatural because i think that's um, that's crucial in this in this matter um i'm a bit of an outsider when it comes to the details of what these dead philosophers all said exactly but there seems to be one point on which i need clarification you mentioned a couple of times the phrase simple beings. But I think that that very term is incoherent. Because either there are beings and they differ and therefore they are not simple. Or we're talking about what is simple, which is being or being qua being, uh, which is probably supernatural necessarily. So I, I, I'm not sure what to make of the term simple beings. Well, how, how could you have simple beings? Yes, I, I, I use the term in the usual uh, Wolfian, uh, Wolfian uh, according to Wolfian vocabulary, uh, simple being is an entity which has no parts, basically, which has no parts, which means real parts external to one another so uh, what is not material is a simple being basically this is the idea so, so all mental beings are simple, simple yes uh, it is a, also the Leibnizian idea of a monad from which part of the Wolfian doctrine of simple being is derived so if the idea is that uh, souls, spirits, minds, and so on don't have parts. So they, in this sense, they are simple, not in the sense that they, are, that they have no, no internal differences. They have, of course, uh, infinite differences within them. They are not, uh, not simple in the sense of uh, the, an atomic physical point or, so, or something which is no internal uh, difference but these differences are not parts okay okay this is a very subtle theory there are differences but no differences <laughs> and not simple uh, i'll have to look up uh, leibniz monad uh, theory to to respond to this but i think there's uh, there's something fundamentally going wrong there um where do you have a it's very much the question if anything can have a physical property. So if there's any difference at all, then it is mental or perceptual, I would think. So the, the very distinction between physical properties or differences and non-physical or mental properties or seems seems odd. But I, I'm talking, uh, I'm blabbering away. I, I have to look it up. So thank you very much. Great. Um, if you if you have further questions, please don't uh, hesitate. And if not, I have I I have uh, okay good. Uh, oh, we have two. Great. Uh, well, please, Robert. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think it goes very fast. Um, thank you a lot, uh, Matteo. And I really liked your talk, and uh, I found it personally interesting because it. Um, uh shed light uh you didn't want to talk too much about that about but uh it actually uh happens to be a discussion as i read it uh, in the research on mendelssohn where exactly kant's criticism is to refer on uh, uh or is to is referring to and um uh for example there's a an article by daniel kroch malnik in the mendelssohn studien uh, in the 2000s uh, uh where he um develops the idea that it actually is directed uh, on the um, second uh, dialogue. Um, 
And um, I found interesting uh, that you developed this uh, Wolfian idea of uh, simplicity as the background, because the word simplicity uh, doesn't really appear in, in the in the first dialogue, only uh, in the second. And also the the compliment the um, uh, compos the the word composite doesn't play a big role in the first dialogue. So uh, it made makes more sense to me now to to also uh, um, think of Kant's criticism as referring to the the first dialogue um, because you uh, explored the the simplicity background uh, very well there. Although it's not on the terminological surface uh, so much in the in the first. Uh, dialogue yes of course in the in the first dialogue the, the argument for simplicity in the second dial is in the second dialogue but uh, the notion of simplicity is uh, uh, so to say is presupposed by the first dialogue by the the the, the, the treatment of the soul's uh, indestructibility so then the, in the second dialogue, Mendelssohn goes on to prove that actually the soul is a simple being and so on. But uh, I think that the two are very strictly connected together. But the, the argument for, for um, uh, the argument I, I wanted to analyze is uh, belongs only to the first dialogue. So it is completed in the, in the first dialogue. Um, great. Uh, Pavel, you, you had a question, right? Um, yeah, but if I think we have time for one. Do you want to ask yours or I don't mind? Uh, I have a very general sort of question. Mine is also very general, but we, we, we can do both. Uh, we have time for both. Okay. All right. So yeah, th uh, thank you very much for the talk, Matteo. Um, I, so this is not my area, so I, and I wasn't aware of the some of the, the the role these early debates and some of these figures played um, in, for example, in Kant and the first critique and such. Um, I wanted to ask, going the other direction or past Kant, to what extent these this debate or this issue survived um, Kant and in what form? Because um, you know, so from the beginning of the eighteen hundreds, you have. Schelling and Hegel, and then later you have Marx and philosophy, at least for us, uh, looking back at it, took this very different form, where probably these kind of uh, questions and issues were less relevant. But of course, um, academic philosophy um, remained. So uh, my question is, yeah, did, did these debates survive in academic discussions um, among in university and perhaps make some kind of a comeback? Or how, how did this how did this um, this issue develop after um, after Kant? Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is a very interesting question, but unfortunately, I'm a, I, I don't I don't know what uh, what remains of this debate after Kant. What what I think it it is still interesting for us in this debate and could have been influential even beyond the the boundaries of a pre-Kantian uh, philosophy is precisely this connection between mathematics and metaphysics, which is, uh, of course, threatened by, by uh, so challenged by Kant, as Karin has reminded us, but doesn't cease with, uh, doesn't necessarily cease with Kant. So the, for instance, I am recently very interested in the, uh, uh, the mathematization of uh, um, psychology, ontology, and metaphysics in general in the Wolfian, uh, uh, in the, within the Wolfian framework by Wolf himself and by his followers. And I think that this, uh, this opened up another uh, dimension for these issues to be, to be, to be, to be interesting. So the, the idea that mathematics can be employed even in the parts of philosophy which are which could be considered to be um, reluctant to be uh, uh, quantified but in fact Wolf himself made uh, several attempts to or at least uh, he formulated some programs for uh, uh, the quantification of uh, the qualities of uh, soul's faculties and so on. 
And modern psychology, uh, in the sense, uh, tended to be Wolfian rather than Kantian. So there is something of this uh, uh, effort to export mathematics um, to even to philosophy and to metaphysics that survived the Kantian criticism, I think. Okay, thank you. So, yeah. so uh, very short uh, notes. Uh, you, the, the two of you used the term survive. Yes, the survival of a debate from one context uh, to the next, and which is which is nice, just given the given the topic. Yeah, yeah I was so thinking of that maybe, theme. maybe debates have a, have um, a better chance to uh, to survive than uh, to solve. <laughs> debates have an afterlife too. <laughs> To survive the destroyer of everything. <laughs> uh, Isma. Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, my question is more about a kind of related to lateness's uh, idea that. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, okay. Uh, he uh, talks about, I think, on uh, discourse on metaphysics that uh, the souls uh, will uh, not uh, lose their uh, memory when, uh, even though uh, these monads uh, just uh, diminishing their perception. I wonder that this uh, Wolf and uh, Mendelssohn and these uh, other philosophers, uh, Precantian, do they give any importance to uh, the uh, uh, memory uh, in case of the soul uh, for immortality because i think in kant kant is not uh, talking much about memory compared to imagination and other uh, mental and uh, perceptional uh, capabilities of the soul but uh, what about these uh, philosophers uh, regarding the memory and immortality that's my uh, question for could you hear me Yes, I think that there is an yeah. important role for memory in the in this post leibnizian theories of immortality in the Leibnizian and the, also in the Wolfian idea of of personal immortality. So the idea that basically, um, in order uh, to retain a personal identity, you have to uh, retain uh, the use of memory. You have to be uh, to be conscious of your of yourself and of your previous states as as being states of your, of yourself. So, uh, in in order to have this to have this uh, sort of a uh, um, uh, memory in the sense of uh, uh, of consciousness, basically. Not memory, because the, the, the in, in Wolfian vocabulary, memory simply means uh, the, the the possibility to reactualize uh, a past perception. But the memory, in the sense of a recognition of a, a past uh, a past content uh, as uh, something that you have experienced, belong requires some uh, um, higher uh, performance of uh, by your soul, so it requires uh, uh, the capability to have distinct thoughts and so on. So we go back to um, uh, Corey's questions that uh, I haven't answered before. The 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 idea that there can be different levels of also of immortality. Um, so you can that you can distinguish between spirituality and uh, personality and I would say that per, uh, the problem of memory uh, is a bit a link between the two because memory is a uh, uh, requires higher cognitive faculties and it is a precondition for personal immortality so for the uh, survival of personality after death but I don't know if Corey would agree or if I have a... No, I think that's exactly right. But I think it also serves to distinguish the Wolfian notion of personality from the Lockean notion of personal identity. Mm -hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, the, the way, the context in which I've made this point before is in, in the context of reading Kant's third paralogism, which is about, I think, personality and not about personal identity, right? So in the Wolfian account, uh, consciousness does not, or memory does not constitute personal identity, it presupposes it. The question is whether we recognize it, right? So I think that's an important distinction, but I also think it leads to a different reading of the third paralogism. But yeah, I, I agree with what you said, though. I think that that captures the same distinction that I have in mind. Do, do, do you want to react to, to, to this point, Matteo? No, I think I agree. Uh, yes. Mm. OK, OK. So yeah, so I will, I will also formulate my, my question quickly. It's, it's also related to, to, to Pavel's point uh, to this. Uh, so my, my question comes from this post-Kantian uh, perspective as well. And, um, and, I, and, and the way you answered Pavel, it, it goes in the direction of what I wanted to ask, because it, you, you mentioned, look, uh, the, dis the discussion here is about philosophy and mathematics uh, going closer to one another, and maybe it's a point that after Kant will, uh, will be discussed again. And, uh, and, and, and it seemed to me that when you're presenting the argument, that the notion of differentials or infinitesimals could be helpful in the context of this discussion, but I didn't see any uh, anyone mentioning it. it but 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 it it was already there, right? Because uh, Leibniz already uh, was already discussing it. So I was I was just uh, wondering if someone in the context of this discussion would uh, introduce this notion of infinitesimals, differentials, and would try to apply it to rational psychology. Because this is something that Maimon, Maimon will make a big deal of, of this notion of, uh, of differentials afterwards. And I was just wondering if, if someone in this context will also try to do something uh, in this direction. Yeah. Well, of course. Uh, uh, basically, the, the, the very um, idea of continuity and then the Boscovich's formulation of continuity also uh, uh, works very well within uh, uh, this uh, this mathematical framework. So uh, probably Boscovich used more uh, Newton than Leibniz's mathematics, but the idea is that basically. Uh, you may think of uh, an, uh, um, an um, approximation. Does it work? And I don't know if the word exists. Of a, um, um, the the idea of a boundary uh, is is already there, and uh, Boscovich uses uses this, this idea also in the mathematical meaning, not only in the Aristotelian meaning, but uh, so he uses. Uh, uh, analy mathematical analysis to uh, also his uh, geometric representations. Uh, uh, of course, he is using the uh, Newtonian Leibnizian calculus for 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 his law of continuity and for his uh, physical laws in general. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so I think we can uh, now slowly bring the formal part of our session today to, to an end. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much, uh, both of you, for this very engaging and, and rich discussion. So thank you. And uh, I would also like to announce the program of our uh, Leuven seminar. So I, I just posted it here. And the next session we have will be on December 8th. It will be a book launch uh, of Dalia Nassar's book, uh, Romantic Empiricism. And uh, the book was recently published by Oxford University Press. And we invited some uh, speakers, uh, some respondents to comment on the book. So you are all very welcome to join. And, uh, and, and, and thank you. So thank you so much, uh, all of you, for, uh, for being here today. And we will 
go on with uh, an informal part of the session. So uh, if you want to, to have a chat and you didn't have an opportunity to ask Matteo or Corey your questions, so you're very welcome to, to stay. Um, thank you.